7, correct? So, managerial economics, uh, 7. Okay, managerial economics, 7. Today, uh, we will deal with, uh, at least uh, we'll begin with, demand, supply, and equilibrium. This is the most important analytical tool in economics. So, section 1 is demand, section 2 is supply, and section 3 is equilibrium. This corresponds to chapter 2. So, Chapter 2, Section 1, Chapter 2, Section 2, Chapter 2, Section 3. So, first of all, we begin with uh, demand. Let's specify, let me first find out and see where we are. Number 1, markets, markets. Okay. Alright, so, we begin with demand. And demand must be always distinguished, which is not equal to quantity demanded. So, demand is the overall willingness of consumers to purchase a particular good or commodity and then we add at various prices at various prices quantity demanded is the quantity that consumers are willing to buy or demand at a given price we use in economics a basic chart and that basic chart usually has, well, every chart usually typically has two dimensional, two dimensions. One here is quantity, and over here it is price. And demand is typically drawn as downward sloping. Downward sloping. We usually put D on the one side and D on the other side and usually this is a curve so we sometimes call it DD curve okay what the DD or demand curve shows is for each particular price the quantity that consumers are willing to consume or effectively pay for at this particular price. So while this whole thing is demand curve or simply shown as demand, this particular point represents the quantity demanded which we we'll just call it let's say Q1 at a price P1. A different point, any different point, will represent a different quantity to for a price to. So Q2 is the quantity demanded at price 2. Okay? So now let me try, I still haven't yet really explained demand. So, demand first and foremost is a relationship. The relationship between price and quantity, which consumers would typically are willing to buy or pay for. And the relationship has three forms. Number of forms. The first simple form is a table. I'm just now 
making up as I go along. A table will be, uh, oh, let's try American consumer uh, for gasoline. Gasoline is at one dollar. He would be eagerly spending maybe in buying 200 gallons per month. If gasoline is two dollars, he'd be paying maybe 100, possibly. If it's three dollars, then 100 is going to be a little bit too much. He's going to be paying probably 80 gallons. At four dollars, it's going to be 75 gallons. At five dollars, maybe 70 gallons. Okay? So, we have a name for this particular table has a well-known name and it's called demand schedule right is this what the textbook says demand schedule demand is this what it is yes okay demand schedule all right so one way to do it is through a table. A different way to do it is, what's it say? The textbook for demand. Hmm? The, the table itself? No, no. no so, so, one is a table. Yes. What's number two? A different form. Curve. Ah, a different form is a curve. Now, curve is not correct, it's not the most broad one. Uh, the correct one is called a graph. So, a graph is a two-dimensional representation between, usually, it's going to be two-dimensional, between two variables, price quantity and price. and price. So, graph. So, typically, the graph will be either in the form of a curve or it will be a form in the straight line, okay? We usually represent it as either a straight line or a curve. And, of course, there is a third form for a demand and we, the form is called a... anybody? Function. Function. In other words, demand represents a relationship between the price and quantity demanded at that price for different prices. So it represents the quantity demanded for each particular price. And it could be represented, that relationship, either in a table like this or in a graph like this, an example here is, particular example here is uh, curve. And finally, it could be represented as a function. All right, do we want to do some function? Any, anyone in the textbook has a function? Well, what's going to be the function over here? Well, I can't really come because it's come up because it's a non-quantitative. So, the quantity will be equal to maybe, let's say, 300 minus uh, let's say uh, 20 times the price. So as the price goes up, the quantity goes down and vice versa. Some we call this functional form. This particular functional form that I used is called a linear functional form. Linear functional form simply means that when the function is represented in a graph as a curve, the curve will actually turn out to be a straight line. All right? Is good enough for now? All right, so uh, let's do some more stuff. I saw somewhere over here normal goods. So if consumers demand a particular good, we have goods going into a number of categories. So if you're a business manager, you must understand the nature of your 
good. One will be normal. normal. Let's start up front with luxury. Then we move to the standard case, which is normal. And then we do inferior. inferior. All right, so let's see how we define each of those. Well, inferior good is fairly straightforward. If income increases, if income increases, you consume less of it. Examples? Um, mobile house. Hmm? Mobile house. Mobile house, yes. Mobile house, that's a bonus point. Perfect example. Mobile houses. In other words, poor people usually live in mobile houses, but as they get richer and richer, they move out of mobile houses into more what we call normal houses, right? They move into normal houses. So, mobile houses. Back in the old days, the classic example in practically all microeconomic textbooks is potatoes. Poor people eat a lot of potatoes. It's fairly inferior good, but as soon as their income rises, they usually add a lot more meat, mm -hmm. and as they're adding more meat, they actually cut down on potatoes, all right? So that's another example of an inferior good. And then you can think of all sorts of other inferior goods once you begin to think about it. All right, luxury, very prominent here in Saudi Arabia. I see everywhere around me. Examples of luxury? Huh? Cars, but of course, not just cars, luxury cars. Uh, yes, uh, there is actually just called the luxury segment of the cars. BMW, Mercedes, uh, Lexus is very popular over here. Some of the, what is called uh, Ferrari will be in the segment of exotic cars. Exotic cars will be Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati. Bentley, Aston, huh? Martin. Aston Martin, all right, so you understand yes. the whole exotic, so in the exotic, uh, the exotic uh, niche of the car market is clearly each example is an example of the luxury. Once you move into the million dollar income, you're suddenly beginning to move into that segment of the luxury uh, market. Well, the typical luxury cars will be, again, BMW, Mercedes, Lexus, what else is big luxury here? In, in Europe, Audi, uh, Audi will, be, uh, will be a big one, Jaguar will be another one. Alright, so then, finally, normal good. What is a normal good? Food. Oh, food! <laughs> Okay, so as your income increases, the demand uh, goes up. The demand goes up, but not as proportionately as your income. Okay. In other words, if my income increases, I'll be eating maybe a little bit more, but not, I won't be eating double. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another example that just crossed my mind on luxury. Watches. A lot of watches will be luxury. Of course, you have basic watches stood on a cheap two five dollars but a lot of the watch market is actually actually watches in the mall will be classic example of luxury goods well almost everything offered in the mall will be an example of the luxury one right as people move in their income they will be moving their purchases from the ordinary local stores to or, you know some other flea markets uh, they'll be moving this to luxury all right, let's see what is uh, next. Uh, the next concept is that of relationship between two goods. So you have good X and then you have good Y. And these are somehow possibly related. Of course, sometimes they may be independent, but we are interested in relationship. Uh, an example of a relationship uh, that we just saw in the United States the last three, four, five months ago, well maybe even two months ago, as oil was pushing over $140 was 
what was happening in the U.S. The gas. Yes, gas prices were pushing uh, over four, close to five dollars. Uh, oh, demand for bicycles go bicycles goes up. Well, let's try with the big one: gas guzzling SUVs, right? That you see here all across. Suddenly, you have a lot less driving of those. You actually have a lot less purchases of those. In other words, gas guzzling and gasoline kind of like go together. They are, how we call them? Complement. Oh, no, they're not substitute. They go together. All right, so uh, let's try for the substitutes. An example will be coffee and tea. Usually an increase in the consumption of coffee will reduce consumption of tea and vice versa. So these we call substitutes. All right, these are called substitutes. So, substitute will be, and that's very intuitive, the consumption of the one naturally reduces the, reduces the consumption of the other. If you have the one, you don't need that much the other. Uh, personally, here are, let's zoom in, camera woman, please zoom in. Uh, we have juice, well, I have juice, and I have water, right? For me, these are almost perfect substitute. I could be perfectly happy with the water, but if I drink a lot of water, I drink relatively little juice, and vice versa. I can, and I have occasionally done for weeks, I could just drink juice, 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 and no water at all. So for me, juice represents perfect substitute for water. Uh, also, I find that for me personally, uh, juice and milk to be good substitutes. I can still go on quite a few days on milk without drinking any juice or any water. So, this is all perfectly understandable. Now, let's get back to the other example of complements. Now, complement or complements. Now, let's uh, first make a very important linguistic note. Uh, the assumption is you're all non-native English, speaker, English speakers, as I am. There's a world of difference between complement, spelled with E, and pronounced with E, complement, which comes from complete. And Compliment, which has two different meanings. The one is what women love to hear from guys, right? Not very well. Right? <laughs> and uh, compliment is actually uh, what we get, complimentary, is what we get from publishers as professors. They will send us a complimentary coffee, oh, not coffee, sorry, uh, textbooks, which is simply free. Free. All right, so in this particular case, no I. It is complement. So complement means that they work together. You need the one in order to consume the other. The typical or classic textbook example for a lot of consumers will be, uh, let's see, coffee. Sugar. Yes, coffee. And... Sugar, coffee and sugar. You know, I, could, I really like to have sugar in my coffee. I find out the taste too bitter. So usually I like, you know, if I don't have sugar, I might even not consume coffee. On the other hand, if I'm consuming five coffees a day, I could literally increase my consumption of sugar five times a day because they don't use much sugar for anything else unless it's in the meal. So they actually go very well hand in hand. So these are called complement. So substitute will be when the demand for one good increases, the demand for other falls, and when in this case when the demand for one increases, the demand for other also increases. So, for example, 
If the price of gasoline collapses in the United States, meaning goes down big time, the demand suddenly for gas gasoline cars increases substantially, and vice versa. The, the, uh, the price of gasoline goes up, demand for gas gasoline cars goes down. That's perfectly natural. There's no, there's no magic in this, all right? Luxury. All sorts of jewelry comes to mind will be definitely luxury, okay? Of course, in the United States, the concept of big gas guzzling SUV now is beginning to be considered as a true, genuine luxury. In other words, you gotta be getting a lot more than the average in order to afford it. At one dollar one dollar per gallon, it's not a big deal, but now it's becoming a big deal. All right, so uh, substitutes, complements. All right, let's see some factors that affect demand. That affect demand and that affect demand substitutability, possibly complementarity and other stuff. So let's just see what affects demand. And we always start with taste, which in economics we have a special word for it. How do we call it in economics? We call it, and we always use the same. This is sign for identity. It means the same thing. It is the same thing. We call it in economics preferences. Of course, preferences are extremely important, and this is the one that needs the least of explanation. You know, some people like to drink coffee, and others just like to drink tea, and that's how it is. And I've been mean, typically, for you know, most, let's say the last 20 years, mostly coffee drinker, and I rarely, if ever, would drink tea. Actually, I'll drink tea only if I have no coffee, and just resorting to tea. So that's fairly straightforward. Similar with cars. Some people just like big cars. Other people just like small cars, all right? Perfectly natural. This is preferences. A lot of times, preferences are difficult or impossible to explain with economics. Preferences are explained with other things. Society, social culture, social pressure, uh, social other things. So, when you move into preferences, you move into some other social areas. So, that's the one thing. Number two is... Uh, okay, so we're considering demand as a function of price. Absolutely correct. But now we're trying to consider other things besides price. We're going to be now expanding. So, moving. What else affects demand besides price. Expected. Price is simple and easy. Expected uh, future. Yes, we just future call it value. expectations. Expectations maybe of war or social unrest, so you better have some food, uh, water and other supplies somewhere in the basements. And of course, lots of, I don't know in this country, sorry, guns and ammunitions. In America, that will be important. You know, you got good stuff in your basement, better have guns and ammunitions to defend it. That's the Western style culture. All right, so expectations. Expectations of a rising price. Now, you have to understand that uh, there are two types of, and very different and similar in a sense, expectations affect affects consumption, but expectation also affects investments. And in economics, if you expect the price of toothpaste to go up, and you buy a lot more, maybe for two or three years, this is actually technically an investment. You're effectively investing in the consumer good, okay? So, you have to understand now the difference between consumption and investment. 
and between consumption good and investment good. And that you can effectively consume an investment good or invest in a consumption good. Right? Investing in a consumption good is you invest in like toothpaste. You buy 10 toothpaste, all right? So, you can do that. Well, can you consume an investment good? Investment goods? No. That you can consume? We what? can. Huh? We could. Yes. Huh? Do you mean if you buy it for investment? Yes, you buy it for investment and without the intention to consume it, but potentially you could. Well, one of the better investments of consumer goods is wheat. Wheat. You know what's wheat? Yes. That's with T, right? Because it's different from wheat, right? <laughs> right? Wheat. Okay, this is what we make flour from and then make bread. Very guaranteed demand, all right? Demand is extraordinary guaranteed. Of course, we will buy it and purchase it actually for supply and price reasons. In other words, because we are expecting that supply will replicate, okay, let's say, relative supply will be less relative to demand so that the price will go up, all right? So this is very tricky to understand. You have consumption and investment, which is different from uh, consumption good and investment good, okay? Now, an example of an investment good is Crude oil. Crude oil is a perfect example of an investment. It's just invest in crude oil. Of course, you cannot directly consume it, but you can consume it indirectly because of its derivatives. Diesel, gasoline, and other uh, crude oil derivatives that we produce. All right? So this is important to understand. Either way, the basic point is that expectations can sometimes be extremely important drivers of demand, of demand for consumption goods, or of consumer demand, or of investment demand for consumer goods, and of course, for investment goods. All right? Fairly clear? Logical? Makes perfect sense. All right, let's see what else I have. Okay. Income? Question? Income is income. Uh, yes, yes, we're going to get to this one uh, right now. I think the textbook specifies six, correct? Yes. All right, so let's move on to the next one, which is a major factor in general, actually very important for Saudi Arabia, is demographics. Of course, for consumption goods, if you simply double the size of the population, the number of people, you would naturally expect the demand for that particular good at a particular price to more or less double. Of course, if you increase mostly with children, you will have one type of demand, right? Child stuff, textbooks, markers, notebooks, little children's books, etc. It's a whole different story. But overall, it is generally accepted. Of course, they'll eat food, but they'll focus more on baby food. So, overall, demographics affects. This needs little or no explanation, right? This is perfectly intuitive. What else? Somebody said something else. Income, which is sometimes called but it is not quite correct, we don't use it in economics, but it's sometimes called wealth. Now, income is the amount of, in this particular wealth, which is produced in one particular yeah. year or in particular yeah. product. So, income is what is produced and available for either consumption or investment in one particular period of time, three months. Oh, oh, oh. Let's make a side note because it's fairly important in economics. It's not in the textbook. Uh, we have so-called stock variables.
and you have flow variables. Income is a classical example of a flow variable. A flow variable is a variable which is meaningful, which has meaning, logical, intuitive, natural meaning, only for a period of time. You know, what is my salary now has no meaning. At one point, salary has no meaning. It, isn't, it said, how much am I getting paid? What is my salary for one month? You know, my salary for one month is a certain amount of money, all right? So it is a flow variable. Stock variable is a variable which has meaning only at one particular moment. Right now, we have a stock of students of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 13. So, number of students is a stock variable. Flow variable will be uh, how many students entered the course over the last three weeks. Over the last three weeks, we started with, originally the stock variable was 10. The flow was inflow of 3, so we have 13 students. And that's it. So, now the current stock is 13. Usually, stock variable represents the quantity available at one period. The flow represents additions and removals within the stock during a period of time. And at the end, you will have a different stock variable, meaning the same stock variable at the end of the period. Your savings account will be an example. You begin your savings account with 1,000, right? You add your salary of 5,000, you spend 4,000, so you add an extra 1,000 during the month. So the savings will be 1,000, initial value 1,000, the end value 2,000, right? Is this perfectly clear? Is it, huh? No? No? Yeah. no not clear? Not clear. All right, so well, let's try some more. Savings is simply the income minus expenditure. So, savings, in income minus expenditure. Suppose your income was $5,000, reals doesn't matter. Expenditures will be 3000 and your savings is 2000 but the problem is, this can be only meaningful, naturally, logically, only for a particular period of time. For example, one month. It has no meaning at this moment. It has a meaning that for a month, I earn a total of 5000 I spend during the month of 3000 All right, so, now we get savings is a flow variable. Now we get uh, savings savings account. My savings account, I'm starting with, uh, let's say, 1,000, we call it this beginning balance. So this is what it is on October 1. Then we have a savings of 2000 this is the same savings over here all right this is the savings during the month the we call it monthly savings and then we have a total of 3000 which in accounting business accounting we call it ending Balance. So the beginning balance is on 00 o'clock on October 1. So this is exactly that particular second where September ends and October begins at 12 o'clock midnight. We have exactly 1000. And at the end of October, exactly the second before November begins, we have 3000. So the beginning balance is a stock variable. The ending balance is a stock variable. 
For that matter, all balances always are stock variables, and the savings is a flow variable. All right? Is it now? Okay, very clear. So, where did I get from this? Oh, 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 oh. Income, let's add this thing, is a flow variable. And wealth is a stock, stock variable. So, wealth, let's define wealth as in economics, finance, and business. Wealth, it represents all accumulated assets that a person, business, or entity, could be government, could be anybody, could be a family, has or owns at a particular point in time. Right now, my current wealth, as you see, represents of two pens, a shirt, a tie, and whatnot, whatever I have right now, okay? That will be my right now, at least, let's call it visible wealth. All right. So, wealth represents the stock variable. Now, wealth will include typically bonds, stock, savings account, money market funds, all sorts of money that you have. It will also include other assets, cars, yachts. houses, yachts. yachts, if you have a yacht, you know, motorcycles. So, all assets, financial, real assets, everything that you own is wealth. So, in a sense, income is a major determinant of consumer demand, but in a sense also wealth is. Now, these two sometimes are known, which is not true in economics, not used in economics, but in popular language, you just ask common people, they have used the word prosperity. Prosperity. This is non-economic, technically not used in economics, but have hey, right now Saudi Arabia is prospering for whatever reasons. We all know mostly rising oil price. And therefore, economic prosperity, macroeconomic prosperity drives demand of everything luxury, right? For example. Well, of course other things too. So in this particular case, uh, prosperity is how people understand it. But it's perfectly say that uh, Saudi wealth dramatically has gone up, including the total value of the oil that is still underground and hasn't yet been pumped. Income will represent the oil which was underground, has been actually pumped and sold out on the market, will be representing income. Income is the dollar, or let's call it the currency, the money representation of the goods and services sold on the market. All right? Good enough? Let's see what else is coming up. Oh, we need some more factors. Let's do some more factors before we take a break. Is the textbook saying there were like six of them? What else? What else? There's the quantity demand of good service. Okay, so that's the quantity demand. That's clear. There's the, the, um, the price related to goods or services. Ah, okay, okay, so, so, related, related uh, prices, related prices will mean prices related to, oh, sorry, prices of related goods and services. Now, let's do this, let's do this, I need the thing to wipe out, where's the... Right, right over there, let me wipe this out uh, and add, oh, this is difficult to wipe out. Professor. Yeah, don't worry. So, in microeconomics, goods which are complements and goods which are substitutes are known as Related goods and services potentially. So, a related good or service is such a good or service where its price 
A change in its price affects the demand of a different good. So usually related goods or services work in pairs. Well, it could be in triplets, but in pairs. All right, so for example, related prices. I just gave the example. Uh, suddenly all car dealers dealing in trucks and SUVs are saying, government, please help me. We're going all bankrupt. $140 oil prices is bankrupting us, all right? In other words, the price of gasoline, they see that demand for trucks and vans and all those gas, gas and vehicles fell down 10 times, 10 times. Can you imagine 10 times? This guy was planning on selling 200 vehicles and with 200 vehicles, he was doing okay. Now he's selling 20 vehicles. He's got, of course, loans to pay and he's moving and going bankrupt. Have a question? No, actually, the, um, the, the air, air travel tickets increased because of the oil prices. Yes, yes, they, they increased. That's, that, that's the cost. So they are effectively, in a sense, related. related. But it's related because due to the cost in production, this is a little bit on the supply side. You see, you're just telling me, well, the, the cost went up. Well, once you start talking about costs, then you're on the supply side. Then you're here, part two, which I haven't started yet. But I will. So, uh, related prices. Suddenly, oil price goes up, and the result is all sales are collapsing. Well, oil price has gone down so far in half, and dealers are saying, you know, good times are here again. You know, other Americans are again buying them all. So, you see, that's an example of related prices. Next fact. That, that's perfectly natural, logical. Next factor. Price of the goods or service. That's yes, its own price. Yeah. There's got to be some more than Number these. Of huh? Number of consumers. Number of consumers. That's already number that. three, demographics. Is that all? Yeah, these yeah. are all the factors? Yeah. That, that, that they're having? Yeah. All right, so demand and demand. Okay, sometimes demand is actually called and, when, and known as demand function. All right, so sometimes we just call it demand, sometimes we call it a demand function. Okay, schedule curve. Okay, now let's introduce another important term, which sometimes is important. In, uh, important for businesses. Inverse, inverse demand function, function. Alright, so what is a typical demand function? Typical demand function here will be quantity is a function of price. In the inverse demand function, price is a function, but now I'm not using f, I'm using a different function, g, of quantity. Alright? So, sometimes you want to know the simple question is if the price is three dollars per gallon how much are they going to be buying and the answer will be 80 gallons the other question that businessmen will ask is I'm producing this month 100 units 100 widgets 100 watches 100 whatever what price should I charge to sell those hundreds all right, so how much should I charge? So a lot of times, businessmen will actually need this the answer to this particular question. Okay, we have, like the car dealer, he says, I have 120 SUVs at 20, uh, let's say $30,000. And he's learning that he's barely selling 20. So the question is, well, how much should I lower the price? Should I lower to 25 to be able to sell them all this month? Why? 
Why? Because he has already ordered from GM for next month 120 vehicles. So when they deliver his 120 vehicles on the first next month, he doesn't have where to put them, right? He doesn't, you know, he's got a parking lot, dealer's lot. He's got only so many spots, maybe 150. So he must sell no matter what. So he will have to do some research or guess or whatnot. In any case, the inverse demand function will tell him, given the current demand conditions, you have to lower the price from 30,000 to 17,000 to sell it all. All right? That's the business question that it answers. All right, demand price, okay. Now let's do the last, or one of the last things for demand. It's called law of demand. The law of demand is extraordinarily simple. It simply says that as the price of any good or service goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. The different way of saying it, well, it is the same thing, is that the demand curve is downward sloping. In other words, the demand curve is falling. This is the meaning. Of course, it, the only way for it to fall is that if the price falls, the quantity demanded will increase. Now, a third way of saying the same thing is that the relationship between demand or quantity demanded and price is inverse, or the relationship is inverse, or demand and price are inversely related. And sometimes instead of inverse, in mathematics we say negative. Negative. Negative means one increases, the other one decreases, and vice versa. All right. Now, one or oh, few more things before we take a break is increase in demand. Increase in demand means that consumers are demanding a higher or bigger quantity for any given price. So, for this price P, now I'm using the red color. Before they were using Q1, now they're using some other quantity. So, in this particular case, we say that the quantity demanded increased for a particular price. Well, for a different price, uh, you have one quantity, now the quantity would also increase. And we say that demand increases if quantity demanded for each price not just changes, increases. Increases. In other words, it changes in the same direction for all prices. In other words, if it goes up for one, it goes up for all. So demand increases if the quantity demanded increases for all prices. In this particular case, as you see, each demand point shifts to the right. Then we say that the demand curve shifts to the right. Shifts to the right. Now, this is the same thing. It's mathematically and logically equivalent. The alternative way to think of this same thing is to say that now, for a given quantity, for a given quantity, demand increases if consumers are willing to pay a higher price for the same quantity. So before the watches were costing thirty dollars, now for in selling hundred units, now you can charge thirty-five dollars and still sell sell the same units. In other words, demand increases. That's an alternative definition, which is mathematically and logically equivalent. If for a given quantity, you can sell it, or consumers will demand a, you know, will demand and will be willing to pay higher price for the same quantity. All right. In other words, demand increases given for a fixed quantity. 
consumers are willing to pay a higher price, or for a fixed price, consumers are willing to buy higher quantity. All right? In either case, they are mathematically and logically equivalent. We say that demand curve shifts to the right. When demand decreases, it shifts to the left. Everything changes when demand decreases. Quantity demanded for a given price goes down. For any price goes down. And the curve shifts to the left. Now, some economists prefer to say that rather than the curve shifting to the right, for a demand curve, they like to say that the curve shifts up. This is perfectly possible. Many economists use, oh, demand curve is shifting up, meaning demand is increasing. And when demand goes down, they say the, sh the curve shifts to the left, but some just say shifts down. And sometimes it is a matter of convenience, and sometimes it's just a mode of thinking. But it's all the same. Okay? So, one last thing again is, suppose that, as in our case, uh, gasoline went from 2 to $4. So, consumers were here and moved over here. In this particular case, when the quantity demanded changes entirely and only due to a change in the price, we just say that we have a move along the demand curve. So we say moving along the demand curve or shifting of the curve. So the curve is shifting because demand changes for some other reasons besides price. besides price. Uh, you had like a couple of weeks ago the so-called Chinese the milk scare. Yeah. Remember the milk scare, right? Yes. Yeah. Children were getting the milk mm -hmm. and they were getting a particular disease, and suddenly the price remains the same, but the demand collapsed because everyone was having health concerns about it. Well, in that particular case, you had a shift in the demand curve. In the United States, suddenly when oil prices went up, doubled, and oil, well, oh, sorry, uh, gasoline prices went up from three to four dollars, you had, in the very short term, a shift along the demand curve. In other words, there was no other major reason for cutting down on uh, gas consumption, gasoline consumption, besides the higher price. Otherwise, if it wasn't for the higher price, they would be still consuming what they're consuming. So, the change of quantity was due entirely to the change in price. Is this good enough for now to take a break? Alright, hit the pause button. Alright, so we